Thanks very much for having me. I really appreciate it. So tonight we're going to talk about still lives and we're going to be talking about pinning loosely. That's pretty much my style and it all comes down to applying paint in a specific shape, in a specific value, in a specific hue, in a specific temperature. Hue, value and temperature is all considered color to me. So putting the right color in the right spot and leaving it is generally the key. So, you know, don't don't go in there and start fiddling around with stuff and mixing things into other things and because that's how you get mud and grays and generally just muted colors really. So I've already done the sketch. You can see the still life on the right, top right. My view is a little bit different than yours, so things might be a little bit different, but they shouldn't be that much. It's a simple onion with a knife, and we're going to get started. And I'm starting off with a half inch brush because um, you don't want to start off too small. And I guess everyone's going to ask eventually, so I will start off here. This color down here in the bottom right is a transparent orange made by Gamblin. Uh, this is Viridian Green. This is a uh, yellow ochre. This is a second yellow ochre. Um, this is Hansi Yellow Medium. Caroline Red, Cad Red Light, those are here because I've been doing self-portraits lately, otherwise I don't use them. Uh, this is a Permanent Liz and Crimson, a uh, Cerulean Blue Hue, which is a Thalo, but I find it too strong. Um, this is a Cobalt Blue, this is Ultramarine Blue, Transparent Red Earth, it's much like a Transparent Red Oxide. You can use Burnt Sienna, it's just Burnt Sienna isn't transparent. This is a Violet, created with my Ultramarine Blue and my Permanent Liz and Crimson, because it's my Cheater Violet. I mix it a lot and this is a black made by my ultramarine blue and my transparent red earth because I mix it a lot and it's just handy to have a pile of it. So I'm going to go straight into the onion with some alizarin and viridian. Kind of kills the red, maybe some ultramarine blue. I'm trying to get a value here because my alizarin just doesn't have that dark dark value that I need, right? And uh, so this is more or less just blocking in. So I don't know how far I'm going to get in an hour. But we shall see. And it's just about brush control. And this is how I paint. Sometimes when I'm outside, I'll be a little more scrubby if I'm laying in a, uh, a bunch of trees or a bunch of water or a sky that's something a large mass. And then I'll, I'll scrub a little bit more. You might see me do it in the, the tabletop here. But what I'm doing is I'm, I'm essentially just looking for a shape. And, you know, I, I equate it to, and it sounds terrible, but I equate it to paint by numbers. <laughs> All right. Everyone's done paint by numbers. They're awesome. You always get a great result. And generally, it's because everything's laid out for you. And you should really start thinking like that um, if you want to be loose and painterly. Um, to train yourself that way anyway, um, you'll eventually break free of that and just realize that you're looking at shapes. And you look at, or don't look at, but listen to any artist who, who paints still lives or from life and whatnot. Uh, they'll tell you right off the bat that uh, it's all about seeing shapes and the right value. And it's just, you'll hear this over and over and over again. But one day it'll sink in and you guys will get it. And I was the same way. I just I just didn't know how to do it. I just didn't know how to do it. And then one day it just kind of clicks. And I had to train myself to use a brush. I mean, brush work's a big part of it. You know, I used to, I used to be one of these kind of painters, right? You know, but I got to hold my brush at, at the end. And the way I did that was... <laughs> I got frustrated by always moving up on my brush, so I, I actually spent about a week or so, and I taped the brush to my hand like this, so I had no choice. I couldn't, I couldn't use it any other way. And that got me to start thinking about the brushes and, you know, that brush, what do you want to call it, uncontrollable issue that you have with the brush when holding it from the end. That's actually a good thing, because it keeps everything loose and soft. You know, you don't have to worry about hard edges, stuff like that. And sometimes there's something bugging you, you can just erase an edge and you, you get that sense of looseness already, right? And it isn't about a gimmick where you, you know, you see a lot of people how they have, you know, their edges bleeding off like that. That's kind of cool, but it isn't really about that. It's about telling your brain that you don't have to worry about these edges. You're not, you're not filling in the shape to the line. You're going there kind of. And already I can tell that that dark isn't dark enough already. You know, I started off dark. And that's what painting is. I heard it once. Uh, painting is nothing more than a series of corrections. I can't remember who said it, but um, best advice I ever got because it made me realize that, oh, wow, yeah, just because I made a decision, I did something. It was right at the time. And I kept on going and I made a few more decisions and then I came back to that previous decision and I realized, oh, okay, well, I guess that decision wasn't the smartest. So now I got to go back and make a new decision to fix it. 
and it's pretty much all there is to it until you're happy with it. Uh, yeah, there is. Um, some people like them, some people hate them. I used to hate them because all the oils and stuff, they made everything just so slippery for me. But I found this stuff, I didn't find it, um, the liquid stuff of the solvent-free fluid by Gamblin. Um, I like the, the liquid stuff. I don't like the gel stuff, but I like the liquid because it gives a, um, I don't know, it just adds a viscosity to it that is really nice. And if I'm not using that, it's just Gamsol, straight mineral spirits. So it all depends on my situation. If I don't want my paint too runny, I'll use um, the solvent-free. And if I want them a little more runny, I'll use Gamsol. Any other questions? Okay. So now I'm getting the other side of this onion. Kind of get in a general value. Yeah, I might as well just scrub that in. Doesn't really matter. We'll adjust some of those values later. We have kind of some dark there. I'll get some white. Yeah, notice I, I avoided the white until now. Um, just because it wasn't really needed. It needs to be lighter. White will quite a, especially titanium white, it's very opaque, right? So if I put it in the darks at all, I'd rather do a scrapey brush stroke to get the translucency of the paint, a dark paint, rather than add white at this stage because um, the white will, when you scrub it, it'll make it chalky and then you got to fix the temperatures and stuff like that. And it's no fun. And so if you have a chalky color, it is because your mix is the wrong value. That's it. Same thing with mud. So every stroke I make is just a line, or a, not a line, but a um, deliberate. So what we're going to do, we're going to get into the, the dark of the back. I mean, it, in the photo, it looks kind of ready, tingy. has a tinge of red to it. Um, my reality, not really. But I'll add it in there anyway. And we'll just scrub this in. So I want to now judge my other my value of my onion to the rest of the painting, right? So now I have to get other values in and around it. And it's going to look kind of kind of dark for you for a while just because of that. there's so much white on the um, the canvas. So I'm going to do a transition though. In the photo you or in the photo on the top you'll notice it's light to dark. Um, I'm going to make it dark to light just because this is the lit side of the onion. So I'm going to have this contrasting with that and this contrasting with that. It's just a fun little thing to do. Portrait painters do it. Um, so why can't I? And I'm also going to make it cooler, I think. We'll see. This might be too too cool and too light. Let's mix or warm it up a bit with some ochre. I find that ochre is a good warmer, warming up color for black. And this is on canvas, so it takes me a while to fill the pores. Um, not a fan of canvas. I really like board. So sometimes you just have to bring the, you know, the environment into the object and the object into the environment for the sole purpose that, again, it tricks your brain into thinking, okay, well, I don't really need to worry about it that much. And then I'll get into, I have a couple pre-made piles here to save time tonight. I usually do not make my, pre-make my colors. There we go. Um, but just for sake of saving time, that is a bit cool. This transparent red orange being oil painter, transparent red or, or transparent orange by Gamblin. Gamblin? No, Gams. Yeah, Gamblin. Beautiful color. Hard to live without. It just it warms everything up so nicely without altering the value too much. It's amazing. Um, if you're an acrylic painter, uh, you're out of luck. Any questions so far? <laughs> all right and um yeah i am cutting around the other objects um to an extent right i'm letting it be there but i am cutting around because stuff like this with the onion with the translucency of the uh, onion skin i'm going to need it white the um the knife uh, it's going to be gray anyway so if i lost a bit of it it's not a big deal um so it all depends what I'm doing. Sometimes I'll lose something entirely and bring it back later. 
It really all depends on the subject. So a little warmer in the background. Yeah, because the worst thing you can do, if you want to paint loose and you're a tight painter, you just have to let go. It's, it can be hard sometimes. Um, and I got this lighter mixture here. It's probably a little bit too light. So a little more ochre. Some of this orange. Maybe some red. And I always use the same colors. It doesn't matter where I am, whether I'm painting gouache or oil. Acrylic. Uh, I haven't touched acrylic in years. I'm not a fan. There's more thinking to do in acrylic, I find, than, than oils. And so the idea with this, still life though, is I'll come in through the knife, the idea with this painting anyway, the thought process, is I'll come in through the knife, I'll kind of go up the knife, and I'm going to make the jump into the shadow and the highlights that are here, and I'm going to come into the onion. We'll see. There's always a plan. Whenever I paint something, there's always a focal point. If you don't think of a focal point, you're just aimlessly going about it. And this is my opinion. Um, I, I don't know why you're painting anything. Uh, you, if you don't have a focal point, what are you what are you guiding the user towards? What do you what do you love about this subject that you're painting? There must be a reason why you're painting it, and the reason being is probably the focal point. Or how can you how can you um, accentuate that that love that you have for what you're painting to just one area, and then it'll be a lot more dynamic, a lot more interesting. And so we got a little bit of dark to light. You can see in the photo the the tabletop here is kind of all lit the same, but I don't like that. I'm going to actually darken it a little bit more. Um, the reason being is it's kind of too static, right? It's kind of plain and, and non-interesting. So I'm going for darker, cooler, lighter, warmer. And this isn't cool enough. It's a little bit too too ochre. And so that that initial value I had in there, I have to change. And this is a little bit cooler. Got to decide where it's going to be. Get rid of the ochre here. And I'm actually going to do a double gradation. So just like skies have a double gradation. I'm, I'm going to go cooler, warmer, darker, lighter, darkest, light, lightest. Reason being though, I don't want your eye to really come here for any reason. It's there for context. So if, if this is the same value of that, eh, you'll kind of make the jump. But if you make this darker, all right, compositionally, uh, you'll kind of go here, but want to come over here because that's where the contrast will be. So the, there's no fussing around. There's no there's no reason to stay here. We will have the shadow of the knife, of course, which would be nice. That'll be in darker there, but in terms of this, that's uh, let's change it a little bit more. Let's get it really dark and really cool. See how this turns out. So yeah, compositionally, not so much interesting. Interesting. So just these little tricks you can do. And then of course we have the front of the wood and that's um, it's darker than this and this. So let's take a big chunk of this, add some ultra blue, add some red earth. And we're looking for value first, all right? Value first, everything else doesn't matter. You know, you're in a general hue, it, you know, it's wood. So, but I need, I need a value. Compare that edge. Uh, yeah, occasionally I have, um, I have an inch and a half. This is only an eight by 10 canvas. So I have a inch and a half and I have an inch and I'll use those on bigger paintings. Oh, it's just eight by 10, it's tiny. Uh, yeah, it all depends. If I'm outside, it takes me an hour and a half, two hours max. Plain air wise, right? If it's um, in the studio, something like this, mm -hmm. ah, maybe the same amount of time, it depends how much detail I want. Uh, when I go larger, that's when things get more lengthy and convoluted, right? But I've spent, well, let's see, um, my last biggest one from my last show was only 18 by 29, and that was done over about, well, it's over like three weeks, but I took some time off and stuff, four hours a day, maybe five days. So we're talking 20, 25 hours. So quite a bit, right? Depending. Depends what I want to say. And we're going to actually do some little knocks like this. You know how that sometimes you get dents and stuff on the table? We'll see what happens with those. I'm just putting them in as a reminder. Down below we'll make this really black, really dark. I'll go into my black, which is a mixture of these two. And this black I generally use two ultramarine blue to one sienna. And that gives me a nice kind of neutral black. 
and then I can easily cool or warm it however I want to do it. I want this line down here to say that this is where we're going to stop. Now, because this line is so low, there's no way this painting, if it was a completed painting, should be ever framed in a back frame. It needs to be front load only. Otherwise, all this is going to be gone. So that's another thing to consider when you're designing your paintings, right? If, um, if they're going to be in a front load or a back load. Um, I think I want that cooler. We'll see. Maybe I'll, ooh, ooh, maybe I'll do cool light here. So let's... I know this is a small area, but this is what gets you excited, right? Okay, we'll do cool light over here. Nice. And then we'll throw some lizard in it. And we'll get hot, hot-ish. We'll see, not too hot. And we'll do warm on this side. Yeah, that's cool. So even even an area that doesn't have any interest, I pay attention to because it's interesting to have a shift there. And it makes things very interesting. There's a whole book out there on Amazon. You can buy it if you want, The Key to Composition. And the whole book, whole book just keeps on repeating in another different way, another way he says it, variety. And if you read the whole book by the end of it, if you don't get the gist of it, well, there's some stuff wrong with you. But variety, variety everywhere, variety of these little things, right? That's what makes a painting interesting. The variety in the reds, the variety in these uh, ochres and yellows, the variety in the black, warmer, cooler, uh, darker, lighter, cooler, warmer, cooler, darker, warmer, dark. You know, it all, it's all relatable. This is light and warm. This is cool and dark. But this is cool and dark, so this makes this lighter and warmer. It's it's an interesting play, right? And so variety, that's the best thing. So when in doubt, think variety. And then you can worry about all the rest of the stuff on top of that. And we have this knife. I'm going to do the hilt first just because... It's dark and it gives me a landmark. Any questions? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I'll tell you why. Color doesn't matter. I mean, we can argue about that, I guess, probably forever. But if you're so concerned about color, you better go get a master's in color. And you better go study all the pigments out there. You have to understand the bias of all the pigments. You have to understand the difference between man-made and organic and what they do, etc., etc., how they mix. Um, otherwise, you're just going to waste your time. It's it's a it's an endeavor, without a doubt. But in the end, I only got so many pigments here, and it doesn't matter what they um, what they are on the canvas, right? It only matters the perception and the harmony on the canvas, not what the still life looks like. I mean, I could change this onion green all I care, but it, it'll look kind of strange just because um, onions aren't green. If you had an apple, you could change the red apple to a green apple, it'd be fine. And I've been, I've, I put a lot of work into color mixing and understanding it. And in my workshops, I talk about it because it always comes up. And I, I can change the way you mix colors probably in, an, in a morning or an afternoon. And you'll go home and probably throw out half of what you own. And it all comes down to, um, it's hard to talk and paint, eh? Uh, it all comes it all comes down to uh, your color bias. Like some reds don't make a mix a violet worth a damn. Some blues don't mix a violet worth a damn. And uh, the reason being is because they don't lean towards a violet. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I, the last couple of years I've added ochre and uh, viridian and this orange. Before it was just all these. I used to have a cad yellow medium, but I got rid of it because I found no reason for it. The cad, that I mean, sorry, the Hansi yellow medium mixes great greens and it also mixes nice oranges. So why would I add another yellow? Except ochre because, damn, sometimes you need that ochre. Especially in, when you're doing la or landscapes in this, this day, uh, not this day and age, but this, um, in this season, right? Everything is... Uh, Everything's ochre. I was just down at Colony Farms there in Coquitlam painting today and everything, all the dead grasses, right? They're ochre. I and mean, you can mix your own ochre, but it takes me too long. I'd rather just take it off the palette. And it's interesting. You can see the difference between a... Um, this ochre is made by Kama, K-A-M-A, and this ochre is made by Winsor Newton, I think. Or, or Gamblin, one of the two. Huge difference, right? This Kama's, Kama's uh, ochre is, is very close to a golden ochre in other brands. It just has a lot more vibrancy, a lot more interest to it. So, where are we? I'm getting lost here. I'm just dabbling here on the knife. Not thinking. And so, with this knife, we have this nice gray here. I 
We have a nice transition. This blade is interesting, right? Because we have a, can you see it on there? Yeah, again, this is dark, this is light, where the, where the sharpened edge is. So we have a natural transition already. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And how much do you need to do on this knife? I don't know, probably that. Uh, probably not much. Uh, let's get into, oh, we gotta do that one shadow down there. Let's keep it warm. That'd be interesting. Oh, it might be too hot. Yeah, damn. I thought I'd have some fun with that shadow. But this is the shadow of the knife. Uh, yeah, I just used my premixed black and white. And so the premixed black is just two parts ultramarine blue and one part uh, transparent red earth or oxide or sienna works as well. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I prefer that just because I can shift temperature. I really love temperature. Um, and don't don't be afraid to buy black. Use black. Um, I'm gonna challenge if you if you believe you don't you shouldn't use black, I challenge you. And if you ever have an instructor, ew, what happened there? That's violet. I have an instructor that says never use black because it kills color. Um, you might want to find a new instructor <laughs> because they don't understand color or pigments. Black's amazing. Man, for the shadow, I'm really fiddling. And I try not to say that out of arrogance. Um, I just say it out of experience. Because I've had instructors told me that. Uh, yeah, maybe we went through a whole era of uh, people just rejecting black for some reason. I don't know why, but... No. No. Um... Oh, drawing, that's a whole different gamut, right? Um, what is drawing? Uh, it, all, it all depends really on on how you want to define it. Uh, I say you don't need to know how to draw. It's, a, it's, a, it's an oxymoron. You don't know how to, need to know how to draw when you're painting, but you need to understand shapes and the relationships, which is drawing. So when I laid this out, for example, quick diversion, you can draw whatever you want for the onion, damned of what's there, right? But really, if you want to get a sense of what's there, you have to understand that this point of the stem is this far from the top. Uh, the bottom is this far. This edge is this far. Then this knife is this far, where this shadow is this far. And so as long as you can keep on maintaining those relationships in the right shapes, you're creating something that resembles what you are looking at. And that essentially is what drawing is. If that makes sense? Okay. Yeah, 100%. And that it's this far away from the shadow. And it's center, this tip center is right on that, well, not right on that, and just, just right at that onion. The base of the onion, right, that comes out pretty much at the center of this hilt. And so understanding where all this relationship is, that's where key. So if you ever paint something that looks wonky, it's because something is off. And that's why you always see artists doing this, right? One onion, that space is three quarters of an onion. You know, this space is, uh, you know, five eighths of an onion. And that's what they're doing. They're trying to get those relationships of those spaces, right? And that's why your drawing looks wonky. It's because you don't have, the, or the painting looks wonky, is because you don't have the the uh, relationships of the shapes correct. An instructor or someone else who doesn't really understand painting and drawing will just say, "Your drawing's off." Well, that doesn't mean anything. How do you fix it? I don't know. Your drawing's off. And so, you really need to understand the whole gamut of spatial relationships, drawing, what drawing is, what painting is. And some people choose to ignore it, right? Some people, right? You look at the guys in, I don't know, 14th century. Man, they had no clue what perspective is, let alone spacing or, or whatever. They'd have they'd have a plinth in a different perspective than a person compared to a different perspective to an animal. So the perspectives or that item that they're doing was correct, but in relationship to each other, all off. But that's the way they did it. And then came the Renaissance and that changed. And then came, came Picasso, and he messed with everybody because he didn't. He took that whole perspective thing a whole different way. He decided that I'm going to break this woman up, but I'm going to look at one eye this from this perspective. I'm going to look at her other eye from the other perspective, and her neck is going to be a top-down view, but her 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 brow is going to be from the left-hand side, where her ear is going to be from the right back, right. And so it's just it's so cool to see him messing with spatial, the sense of space space to create cubism. Anyway, so we got a beautiful shadow in there. Ooh, nice. So let's get the this ready thing in here, the peel and then the um, handle. The handle is kind of the same as the um, 
the tabletop, but it's cooler. And it's, so we're just gonna add a little bit of blue to it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, I always use white canvas, white board. I've been down that whole avenue toning it, blah, blah, blah. That said, if I'm out in the field and I feel it necessary, I'll wash it. I do this very rarely. You know, I'll do the wash and then I'll pull out with the lights. Or if I'm doing flowers, I'll do that. However, it's all done at the time. So if I want, right, I can do beautiful stuff like this. Right, I can I can pull it off and I can get it. It's hard to see there, but you get a beautiful glow that you can't get if you underpaint and let it dry, right? Um, and the reason why I use a white palette, this this used to be this um, uh, at the bottom of my palette. I have a mid gray and a black, but it used to be all mid gray in my palette until the beginning, uh, well, more or less December, because I said, oh man, I have a shot box that uses white in it and I didn't think I liked it that's why there was always neutral gray here but I started painting the white and um, I really liked it and I'd come home and I'd be frustrated with painting on the gray because <laughs> I couldn't get a sense of my colors I, I couldn't get the sense of how vibrant they were with the gray right and so I said screw it and I scraped the back off and now I just paint on white because you can get a very good sense of where the neutrals are shifting are they shifting to a cooler warmer green or yellow or orange or Kind of thing like that right and with the 50 percent, i just couldn't get that new that uh that sense so i hope that answers your question and we're going for value of the desktop where the knife is it's quite dark and a good way to judge is darkness like instead of looking at the shadow if you're in a still light painting it from life look at the uh, look at the um the half tone of the onion and sort of judge the shadow in your peripheral and that gives you a good idea how dark the, the value is. Just because if you start looking at something for a long time, especially a dark, uh, um, a shadow, if you keep the longer you look at it, the lighter it gets. And next thing you know, you've bumped it up. And same thing with the lights. Uh, the longer you look at your lights, the darker they get. And that's why you see uh, a lot of beginner artists have their tonal values. Um, all close together you know their lights are too dark and their darks are too light it's always good to judge a shadow by your peripheral vision and I like I'm gonna push that a little darker I'm gonna bring that into the knife so and then I'm gonna go across there we go and gray wise I just gotta fill in this white a little bit and I gotta get it some of this wood color there just to fill it in to get a sense of what's going on but uh, before I work on the um, onion again I'm just gonna lighten this uh, background I had a little bit of ochre in it. Not enough. Just because I want to know if those darks are dark enough on the... I'll keep it scrubby. Kind of gradate it. There we go. Soft edge. Fix that. Bring the background into the foreground and the foreground into the background kind of thing. It's because it doesn't really matter, right? And a good way to test if these little thingies here bug you, like those little marks or the little soft edges, stuff like that, if that bugs you, you, know, you, you look at your intended focal point and your peripheral vision, if stuff like this bothers you, then it, you need to fix it. If you look at your focal point and stuff like the strange marks that doesn't bother you, no need to fix it at all. Or if someone comes by and say, I don't really like that, and you just leave it intentionally. But, all right, let's get more into this. Actually, let's get into this and fill this in. Okay, so another half hour. Any more questions?
Uh, the whites I'm refer, I guess you're talking about uh, lead white and also um, zinc white. Um, the uh, titanium is really opaque, without a doubt it's standard, it's cheap. Uh, zinc white, it's uh, translucent, uh, but it, there's a problem with it and it cracks. Um, so even I won't use it and I, I don't really care about, I care about archivalness, but if it's going to last 100 years, 50 years, it's good enough for me. But zinc white's terrible, I won't even touch this stuff. Uh, lead white, I never bought it. Um, I hear people love it because it's transparent, right? But I, I've just never used it. And so titanium white it is. Sometimes I'll tint it with a little bit of yellow when I go outside, so it it's a warmer white. I don't have to worry about adding the yellow after, right? But uh, let's get into this onion here now. So everything's blocked in. Kind of have our values going. And on this drawing, if you're interested, I probably spent hmm, half an hour in a drawing getting everything right. Just because if you don't have the drawing, and what I mean by drawing, I mean the shapes. I wasn't really concerned about anything else, really. Well, you saw it at the start, right? It was pretty. Pretty limited. No, I, I used charcoal. Just looking where some of these nice reds are. Uh, out of habit, but not always. <laughs> I'm not a set rule kind of guy. It's kind of order of operations. Uh, what do I want to establish first? It's kind of what I go for. And I really was excited about the onion, so I started with the onion. And then I decided instead of going to the tabletop to see if the values were right because of the darks, I wanted to go to the background because that had to be dark. So that helped me fix that. And so it's really about your process. You'll find your process the more and more you paint, right? You'll, you'll figure it out. Landscape's entirely different. Sometimes the sky and the landscape's the last thing I do. No, no, because um, you, you, uh, best to use vine charcoal. If you use the, the hard bricky kind, right? The sticks, stuff like that, that is, that could be problematic. But um, vine charcoal is so soft and so, I want to call it kind of, not dirty, but it, but it's dusty. In a sense that once it's on there, it's great. But if you blow on it or take a paper towel and just go, it'll, it'll come off, which is really nice. And so you never really have to worry about it in terms of messing up with your pigments and you saw how little was on there anyway right i mean a little bit of the onion skin there let's have some fun with this um stem and i'll send off a uh i won't finish this tonight or yeah tonight but when i do i'll send it off to uh send it to everybody or post it yeah i'll throw it on my instagram as well Ah, yes, good question. Called me out. That's fantastic. In the end, it's going to be here. All right, I'm doing all this beautiful dancey stuff on the on the um, onion because we've got to establish uh, arguably a little bit light. I will see. But I really love the contrast uh, between the shadow and this light. So this won't be there. I, I just did that as an example. And I'm going to push the contrast here. So the idea is you come in through the shadow come up through this knife, hop over to this, and this will be so bright that you're just going to go over there. And then when you want to relax your eye, you'll go everywhere else and kind of notice the fun little things of the onion and the onion peel. And then come back. Uh, without a doubt, number one, number one has to be Scott Burdick. If you don't know him, he's an amazing painter in the States. But he'll paint a portrait with like 18 pounds of oil paint. I don't know how he does it. But the amount of paint he has on this, oh my God, it's crazy. I can never handle that kind of paint. But he's just sloppy, but he's so good with understanding the differentiation between his his values and his temperatures that they don't get intermixed and nothing gets muddy, right? Um, that's where I really got that whole concept of that. I would say him for sure. And then I have um, other people I just admire. I, it's hard to think of the names. Instagram's full of them. You know, you got your 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 local Maria Josen hands. Um, oh, Joshua Bean in the states. My God, that guy can paint like a machine. 
Oh, there's so many. I need, I need to be prepared with that question so I can make a list. But find them over time. Not really. I kind of stick to... I, I found my love. I love this kind of loose impressionistic style. And if you paint that way, and if you paint better than me, I'm going to like it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I have no qualms about knowing that someone's better than me. And then just admiring and figuring out how they do it. Before it used to cause quite a bit of depression, right? Thinking, oh God, I'll never get that good. Um, but I, I've been seeking out this kind of information for a long time now. And it's just the way it is. And uh, has it changed me? Yeah, without a doubt, because it's what I love. It's what I want to do, right? And I didn't take a workshop. I still haven't taken a workshop for years just because I didn't want that, want that influence. Um, now I want to take workshops. But all these artists that I want to take workshops with... Right, they're like seven, eight hundred dollars US, and I don't have thirteen hundred dollars to burn through, so it's going to be a while before I get into that. But you'll find your love. I remember once again, Robert Ginn. I was with a group doing a, anyway. A group of I was involved in a small group brought him in, and he gave a great talk. And I always looked at people like Ginn and Swab and all the other artists out there. Like, how can you just stick to one style all the time? Isn't that boring? And that was my attitude. And I, this is when I was early, early painter, and I just wanted to just paint things. And um, so I was, you know, a little naive, a little, I had no filter. And so I asked him, I go, don't you get bored just painting what you paint all the time? And I didn't mean it as an insulting or anything like that. I just said it. And he, I don't think he took it insulting because he says, well, look at it this way. I, I love painting what I paint. And he says, you will too. And I didn't believe him. <laughs> and lo and behold, you know, I'd, I'd, I'll paint this way forever. Once you find what you want to paint, that's it. Boom, you're done. And you'll, you'll seek out everyone who paints the way you do to get better at it. And it's good to dabble, right? I'll, I'll throw my hat into, uh, into um, abstracts, 100%. Will I get lucky? Yeah, I'll get lucky. Will I be, be consistent lucky? No. <laughs> But uh, understanding abstracts, abstracts has kind of been my goal for the last couple of years because there's so much more to it. And you know a good abstract when you see one, but to paint one, it's a little bit difficult. So that was my long-winded answer. Hopefully that works out for everybody. Uh, you mean the temperature here to this? Uh, so you're kind of seeing these two temperatures is relatively the same. Uh, yeah, on the real life, this is this has a more ochre in it, so it's a little more warm, and this is no ochre in it, which is a little bit cool. But great question. And if that happened to me, I'd definitely change it, right? I'd make the, the blade cooler. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I want I want a, I want a darker, cooler, lighter, warmer, just for that reason that I wanted to, that it, I wanted to see this edge, right? And so now we're getting to the nuance, and you, you'll notice when I'm painting this onion, I'm I'm putting down a stroke, <laughs> and I'm, uh, as a, as a little test, I'll go in and adjust. I might go in again and adjust. And that's, that's essentially is painting surprisingly loosely. Painting loosely isn't about blah, 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 right? Throwing stuff with the canvas. To get this get this feeling, it's all about understanding where your brush stroke has to go. If you don't understand where your brush stroke's gonna go, what kind of what are you doing? And it, it takes a discipline, it takes an understanding that it's a process. You gotta trust the process. I mean, this looks like crap down here. This is coming along before it looked like crap etc. Each part has to just develop on its own, but together in a sense, right? And it, it's looking for that shape. That relationship. Yeah, I have to agree with that 100%. And thank you. <laughs> um, if, if it isn't, what's what's the point? And yeah, that's a that's a perfect way to look at things. Now the shadow, very dark, very monolithic. Um, what we're gonna do? We just have ten minutes while I play with it. Okay, yeah, I'll work on this area here. I'll build the shadow and I'll show you the highlights where I want the focal point to be. 
So with the shadow, it's very monolithic, but you can see in the photo, you can see the translucency of the onion skin that's hanging off the side of it. So we're going to have to make it lighter in value. I got to do that by adding white, but I got to make sure that I keep that, the chroma of the red up a little bit, but not too much. So we'll see. Well, that's just, that's just way too much, right? So we got to bring it back down again. I don't even know what I use there. I've lost my pile. Which is good. Sometimes losing your pile that you've been mixing in is good because then you you remix it afresh and it's slightly different. And it's that slightly different that makes it interesting. Again, it's variety. Variety, variety, variety. If you want to paint better, the only thing you need to think about is variety. <laughs> so that's getting there. This here I see, I'll put this in here right now, but I see that greener. But since I got red on my kind of ready mix, it's like a burgundy. Oh my god. Um, I'll go a little bit lighter. Step it up. Because you can see that you get a real, I don't know, what's that called? Halo effect. That's a little bit too cool. It gets lighter in there. Right? It's all about nuance. And it doesn't take much. It's just that little bit there. And I'll switch over to a little smaller brush and I'll go into um, maybe something a little bit greener. And I use Viridian. When I say greener, it looks greener, I'll just dump in my Viridian. I could add yellow and blue if I wanted, but uh, Viridian, I, I just, it's a crutch now, unfortunately. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It took me a while to understand how to use it. And don't get Viridian hues. My God, they're garbage. I mistakenly bought a Um, a hue once. Oh, it's just garbage. But it would work in other situations. Um, it just is garbage to me because that's what I'm expecting. I'm expecting a Viridian, but it had black in it, so it wasn't a Viridian. It was a dulled down. It was a unchromatic Viridian. And so it really screwed with how I looked at things. So in a different situation, maybe in a limited palette, I'd love it, right? But uh, there we go. Finally got that. Took a while. You see it now. Here's the other thing. Here's the tip. Just because it looks like something on your palette doesn't mean anything. It was greener on my palette, but until I put it on my my canvas, I had it, I had no idea. It was too blue when I put it on my canvas. Kept on adding green. Added a little bit of yellow until I get this mixture, which is relatively a green, but it's finally green when it's on my canvas, and that's what's important. And I put it down, I put it in a stroke, right? I kind of may, I might add another stroke. Pardon me? So what I'm doing now is I'm bringing out that light. Okay, I'm just bringing out this light so I can get that contrast. And maybe I'll add one little bit here. Just to stand back, see what it's like. Yeah, not bad. Kind of that's this the extent of my blending, right? I don't do a lot of it. I just want to see. And so I brought this up a little bit. I think what I'm going to do is have some fun. I'm going to try to. What happens when I do this? Yeah, not bad. I don't know if I'll leave that there. We'll see. But anyway, here's my accentuating part, right? I'm going to add a little more white, but that's going to cool it. So I go in this be into the beloved orange, <laughs> my transparent orange, and it keeps it warm. Like if I had the right pigments, had like I could probably use a pearline red and my Hansa yellow medium and get there. But and I scoop, I, I lay out my paint and I scoop it. Right, got a big nice chunk of paint on there, and this is when I kind of choke up on the brush, put a nice stroke in there. 
Nice stroke in there. Soften some edges maybe. Maybe I can use that down here for these dents that are in the board. That's definitely way too late. So we're coming near the end. I think we're close to 8.30, aren't we? I don't know. I can go, I can go all night if you want, but is there any questions? Yeah, yeah, and they're not always. Uh, Viridian, I switch between um, uh, Gamblin, uh, Opus Brand actually uh, makes a good Viridian, and um, Rembrandt. Rembrandt makes a good Viridian as well. It all depends. It's a trial and error. And the only reason this is on here, the Windsor Newton uh, Yellow Ochre, is because I have to use it up. It's not my yet. I really don't like that Yellow Ochre. It's too, it's too cool. But I leave it on my palette just because... Um, I don't want to throw it out and I use oil paint and I have a cover that I put over my palette and I spray it's a wooden cover and I spray the inside of that wooden cover with clove oil and clove oil fumes keep oil paint fresh so this 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 yellow ochre you can see how fresh it still is um, it's been on my palette for over a year now <laughs> so if you don't want to waste paint and you work in oils go buy some clove oil um, I don't like what happened here. I screwed that up. Just fix that. Oh, yeah, 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 100%. I don't mind teaching acrylics. I don't mind doing a quick demo here and there in acrylics. Um, with acrylics, you know, because because of this, I can, with oils, I can change edges anytime I want, right? Within my working period. With acrylics, I have to focus and I have to worry about my edges right away. And I, and I don't like that. That's too bright. It just adds another dimension. And then in my my paint dries. I don't really like that. <laughs> some some people well, acrylic doesn't dry fast enough, and for others it just dries too much. Whoops. There we are. So now you can kind of see we go in through the knife. We come over to the onion. I'm gonna try to actually accentuate that shadow a bit more. Too chromatic. Chromatic. I mean the vibrancy of it. So color has three aspects of it, right? The hue, the chroma, and the temperature, or in value. So I guess four. There we go. So we come up through here. It's still not dark enough, but I mean, I can, let's not worry about it too much. And then why well, I want to make the jump from the, the knife to the um, shadow. So maybe I'll lighten this green a little bit. And I'll, I'll make a little nice nuance there, and then maybe that'll pull me over, right? If that doesn't work, maybe I'll do the old trick of bringing the object into the background and the background into the object. So maybe there's an instance here where I can pull some of that, that knife in, and I can bring that shadow down. And this side there. And the only reason I can tell if I like that or not is I'll look at my focal point. If this doesn't bother me, these marks I've made, then I'm fine. Um, I think I'm going to adjust that shadow a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, one of the things about painting is, you know, if you, you, if you sometimes it can be looking really rigid, and that's because you have the objects on the background, the background cut away from the objects, etc., right? So I like to say bring the object into the background and the background into the object. And what it does is it helps create a sense of overlaying elements where there aren't any overlaying elements so in this instance right i can bring some of this the shadow this way and bring it bring, bring it closer to the knife or i can bring the knife into the shadow and individually if i look at this i go oh, i kind of don't like that but that's not the point i'll look at my focal point and if this bothers me then i'll change it if it doesn't i'll be fine in terms of um i want to do that i think in terms of just the reading of the painting, if that makes sense. And that way you get these edges that overlap and you get softer edges and... Well, yeah, 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 if some, if some mark is so bad... i just put the shadow in here. Yes, it's context only. Yeah, I might... Well, we could try it. Let me do a couple strokes here. No, I never, whoops, I never use linseed oil because I've, 
I find it's too slippery over and over of use right oh you know back in the day I used to uh, clean my brushes with linseed oil but I never use it as a medium been there done that ah yeah just clove oil you know that stuff that they used to use for um, toothaches yeah okay cool you can find it in pharmacy but you get a small jar like that big for for like 10 bucks or whatever it's pretty expensive but if you go to a soap soap store or aromatherapy store you can usually find clove oil yeah clove clo this stuff clove clove leaf oil or clove bud oil whichever yeah it smells great yeah clove leaf's the cheapest uh, it does a little bit but yeah i agree and that, that's brush control and understanding that what I'm putting down is required there. And that means I don't have to kind of blend it in, if that makes sense. So let's go to the handle and throw in another value. Uh, generally, the consensus for me is I'm a designer by trade and I made all these little rules to myself. If, um, if you want an object to look more defined, put three values in it. If you just want it there for context... Um, leave it at two so we have kind of two values here for the handle but let's add a third and we got to be careful we got to be subtle right we can't put a it's wood so it's very diffuse so it doesn't have our sharp highlight but if, if we put this light in here too light that's nice um it'll detract from our focal point so we can put something in there let's soften that a little bit and i kind of just negated it when i softened it so let's put it in a little more harsh um, kind of this edge, but you got a nice hard edge here, but I want to keep this edge soft, otherwise that's going to look funny. So it's a careful, careful dance, right? Yeah, it's okay. Maybe change this value here. I preferred it without it, but I just wanted to show you. That you could put it in we do have a little sense of um where is it here highlight on the hilt where the ellipses are and let's have some fun and put a little bit a little bit brighter highlight on the um knife you gotta be careful though because if it's too bright it's going to take away from the rest of it so it's a, it's a gamble right you want to do something do it but let it be known that um, you're risking the focal point so you put it in stand back yeah it's not bad it doesn't really take away too much from the focal point so we'll leave it in there I could probably make that inside of that hilt a little bit darker though there we go. And we could probably make that occlusion there. That's the word I was looking for, occlusion, um, where that onion peel transmits the light through it. And it's subtle. And I can do a test. And I like it. So we'll put it in. And you just got another little step in there, right? It looks a little more orangey in the photo, but for me it's more more of the red. And um, we could have some fun with the onion up top. And I have to, I have to say, with all of this, right? Take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. Question everything. It's the only way you're going to learn. Don't go blindly into saying, "Oh, Michael said this. I should do it." Those are the beliefs I've constructed for myself. And I, I but I keep open-minded, right? I'll use black. I'll, I'll do all that other stuff. But um, some things work for other people, and some things don't. So, if what I'm saying works for you, absolutely fantastic. If it doesn't, Try it a different way. And if we want, we could scrape. That doesn't work very well with canvas. That little bit is working. All right, scrape some onion, onion lines in it. They got too white, so what we can do is you can just dab them over with a brush. So I love scraping, but uh, it's not a, it doesn't work that great on canvas. It kind of does, eh? A little darker there and so I didn't really work too much on this onion down or the onion peel 
and so it's lacking of course but you get the gist right the idea is you come up through here and that means I gotta make this dark dark down here so it's cool on that side and it's warm on the other it's because I love doing stuff like that it's interesting So now we come in through here, hit the knife. Arguably, we could make this a little bit darker to make the transition up. Why don't we do that? It's in medium to flow. Help that contrast get up there. Pull zone. I gotta get that little white part off. There we go. And maybe we can bring this into that. For the only reason so we can easily make the transition into that shadow a little bit better that's it it's the only reason i'm doing it not to be cool not to have one of those paintings with all the drips and all the fancy brushwork all over right it's it's because i wanted to make this transition into into there a little bit nicer and we could bring out the knife and it's not really there but i'm going to try it anyway so on this edge i'm going to put a little lighter gray And the whole point of that, I gotta test it first. A little bit later. And the whole point of that is to, so it's not so organic. I want a little bit of edge there, so there's something to skip over. It creates a little bit of interest. The line's gonna be so line, so thin that it's not gonna stand out, but it'll create an interesting aspect. And help, again, divide the two objects. Got a little thick, pull some of that off. Maybe that knife right there. Good. Overall, not bad. Start getting rid of some of these white marks. Softer edge, because it doesn't matter. It's just there for context. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. I forgot the tape. Let me just finish the highlights here, and then I'll pull the tape off. So the highlight of the Indian, um, just because we need to push it. It's a semi-cool light that I have on there, so I got to, um, no, I just got to get the value. So I, you know, I, I mixed my value, then I added some blue to make it cooler, which darkened it. And when I tested it, it wasn't light enough. So it's always a dance. That actually might be good. All right, so this shape goes like this. I always make sounds when I make the shapes because it keeps me focused. And here we go across, a little bit in there, and that's there, and it's a little bit just here. It's not really there in real life or on the photo, but I just want that little bit of something. Go ahead, do an adjust. Get that dark right here, so I have that contrast. Again, not something that's really there. But it got too cool, so I'm gonna stick on my end. I gotta make it warmer. There we go. And just the way this comes down, it fixes there. All right, so I think we'll leave it at that because I can paint for another two hours while you guys watch. But. All right, let's get the tape off. You guys have been very patient. Thank you very much. So, because of this line, right? Definitely um, something that needs to be front loaded. Otherwise, you lose that. You lose a quarter inch all around. So even this onion would look constrained within the frame. So always something to consider whether you're going to front load it or back load it. Any final questions at all? Uh, no, I, I don't do liners or anything like that. What I'll do is I, I make my own frames and I have a custom profile that I use and I back mount those. Worst case, I create my own uh, frames and I front load. And then when I front load, I'll take the canvas um, and I'll mount it to a board if it's not already on a board. And then I'll, I'll glue, glue the board into the frame. Yeah, yeah. I spot glue it, I guess you could say, right? The corners and 
in the, in the middles of everything. That way it can still be removed, right? Uh, but it's secure enough that it's gonna go and move with the frame as well. Oh, you're welcome. And it takes it takes a discipline, so be prepared for that. Just to get away from what you're doing, it's hard. I've, I've been there. And that's why I used to tape the brushes to my hand. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, for sure. And with the brush, right, hold it by the end. Uh, and don't be afraid to hold it like this or hold it like this. I drop, drop my brushes all the time just because I'm holding them by the end, but I'm holding them in different directions, right? Uh, as well, just look for shapes of color. So when I first did this, shadow on the onion, the shape. When I was doing the lights, I did the shape. When I did the shadow, I did the shape, right? And then once you get into those big shapes, then you can find the smaller shapes and put in the smaller shapes within the bigger shapes. And focus, just say shape, 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 mix and value, right? So look for the shapes in your painting, hold your brush, and then when you're doing your shapes, make sure you're mixing the right value and temperature. Values first, 100%. And then your temperature. You can always change the temperature when it's the value you want it. So those are the three big ones, I would say. <laughs> no doubt, eh? Isn't that funny? Yeah, and it, I mean, here's the other thing. Yeah, 100%. You said it nailed the nut, right on the, the head there. And um, that's saying that I heard that uh, painting is nothing more than a series of corrections. Um, changed the way I painted. And I went, then I just started painting and I didn't care. And that's it. Uh, you know, when you say you don't care, it's not that I didn't care about the painting. I didn't care about so much the end result. I just cared about the elements within the painting and then the painting came together. And so if you not, if you're not held back by creating a painting, you're going to create a work of art that's better than what probably you would have intended. Cause we always, always get to that stage, right? Where we we're doing a painting and saying, Oh my God, it doesn't look like the painting I had in my mind because we always think we have to make a finished painting. Every time you buy a canvas, I, I need to make this a finished painting. You don't. 100% do not. My pleasure. Take care for everyone. Bye-bye. Cheers.